This session is The Pandemic and Parks, Lessons COVID-19 Reinforced About the Value of Public Spaces and Outdoor Recreation is hosted by Huron Clinton Metro Parks. Please welcome Director for Huron Clinton Metro Parks, Amy McMillan. It's always great when you bring some of your best friends to your, your first Mackinac Policy Conference session. Thank you all so very much. My name is Amy McMillan, and I am the director of the Huron Clinton Metro Parks. We are so excited to, to be here today. Um, I first attended the Mackinac Policy Conference in 2019. And I only did so with the, the support and encouragement of my board. And um, one of my board members who was the most supportive and encouraged me um, to come to the conference is Bernard Parker, who is with us today. Yeah. So I have to tell you, I was not sure what to expect when I came to the Mackinac Policy Conference. I was more than a little bit worried that I would find myself sitting on that big, iconic porch all by myself while everyone else was shaking hands and catching up like they've known each other for years. This was not at all what happened. My fears were totally unfounded. The connections were many and they were meaningful. The energy was palpable. The ideas to address challenges and opportunities were real and they were actionable. The commitment to the region and the state and to working together was inspirational to me. After that first day, I knew that the conference was an important stage to relaunch, to, I'm sorry, to relaunch and share the Metro Parks brand and to share the tangible dollars and cents value of investing in public parks and spaces. I began imagining that 2020 presentation even before I got to, on the ferry to go home. 2020, of course, reminded us that life can be unpredictable. But among the silver linings of such a darkly cloudy year, 2020 also reminded millions of Michiganders of the values of public parks and public spaces, parks of all shapes and sizes and in all places. They represented the one true place and the chance to safely and socially distantly connect with nature and to reconnect to each other. With people flocking to our parks in unprecedented numbers, the relaunch of the Metro Parks brand has in many ways taken care of itself. But the true value of public parks is a lesson that must outlast the pandemic to ensure that these resources and the significant value that they bring to us intrinsically and economically lasts for generations to come whether locally, regionally, or across our great states, our great state, parks are an important part of our experience in daily life. And that's why we're here today. And it's why I am so excited by being joined by my esteemed and committed colleagues, Alicia Bradford, the director of the Wayne County Parks, Dan Eichinger, director of the Department of Natural Resources, and along with the extraordinary Vicki Thompson. We want to spark a conversation and share what we have learned over the course of our careers, particularly the last 18 months of COVID-19, and how investments in public parks can and do generate wide-ranging economic, health, and environmental benefits. They bolster our communities and they improve our quality of life in so many ways. So thank you to those of you who are joining us in person and those of you who are joining us virtually today. We look forward to this conversation. Joining Amy McMillan on stage, please welcome Parks Director, Office of the Wayne County Executive, Alicia Bradford. Joining Alicia Bradford on stage, please welcome Director of the Michigan Department of Natural Resources, Dan Eichinger, and to moderate the discussion, Communications Director for the City of Detroit and Black Business Minute Reporter for WWJ News Radio 950, 
Vicki Thomas. Well, hello, good afternoon, good afternoon. It's so great to see so many faces, some familiar, some not so familiar. Uh, welcome back to the island. Welcome back to the Mackinac Policy Conference 2021. We are here. Let's give ourselves a round of applause. So this is a very important discussion because really I believe our parks, our green spaces, our green ways, our river walks were our saving grace and have been our saving grace during this pandemic. It was a place where we could go where many other things were shut down. And I love the one photo on the screen of the Detroit River Walk, which some of you may know was voted the best river walk in the country. And I know that the attendance along the River Walk shot up during the pandemic. So our conversation is about what we are seeing, what we anticipate seeing, overcoming any challenges that the park systems may have. And I'm just curious, like, did any of you on your way up here, did you stop at any park or take advantage of any of the beautiful trails in our state? Anybody? All right, all right, we have a few, I love it. I know a couple of people even rode their bicycles from Detroit all the way to Mackinac City. Now that's, that's a feat, right? <laughs> I'm sure we'll be hearing more about that uh, during the course of the conference. But let's get started with this conversation. As I said, you know, the parks were our saving grace. So Amy, let's start with you. Uh, what have you seen and how have you been able to deal with the increase uh, in attendance in, in the park system? Thank you so much. Well, you know, prior to 2020, we were actually experiencing some, some declines in attendance at the Metro Parks that had taken place over a period of many years because there were so many competing interests, including those screens that you know so many um, kids and adults have been glued to. And frankly, at the beginning of the pandemic, we were concerned about whether we'd be able to be open. And so as soon as the, the news came that the parks could be open, we got into high gear. We, um, at the Metro Parks, we had three free days a week at the beginning, um, which was also tremendously supported by our board. And, and people just started coming out. And then they kept coming out over the course of the entire year, our attendance was up 35%. Wow. 35. We had a goal of getting to, of raising that decline by 1%. And so we were up 35% um, across the board. And um, you know, every single boat rentals, trail use, um, golf courses, uh, the rounds of golf just exploded. So it was, um, you know, seeing people reconnect to public spaces in that way and really being able to um, really articulate what they meant to them, right? And, and talk about how they felt better physically and how they felt better emotionally and that idea that you could be out and see people and not be as afraid in an outdoor space, right? Were the Metro Parks ready? Were you all ready for that 35% increase? Oh, I have to tell, we were, for, um, I don't know if we were, because I mean, who knew, right? Um, but we have just this really tremendous team of, of employees who are so committed to the Metro Parks, who are so committed to service. And it, it took us a minute, I will say that. Um, one of the things early on, um, we, we talked about uh, when we were trying to get people to socially distant, and I know um, Alicia and Dan and I had um, did a letter to uh, an op-ed early on because we couldn't get the people on the disc golf courses to, um, to stay away from each other. And so we said, all right, dudes, we're shutting down disc golf for a couple of weeks. And, um, and that got the message out. And, and as soon as we reopened, people were like, hey, not only do we want to be out, but we're going to be safe when we're out in places. We're going to take care of them. We're not going to leave trash. I know that was a challenge. We're going to be really respectful of these environments and, um, and help you take care of them. And that has just been a tremendously valuable process. I mean, you just can't imagine some of the, the comments that we get from, from people and from families. Um, the memories that they're creating in our, in our parks and our public spaces are, are phenomenal. 
And Alicia, tell us about the impact that the pandemic had on parks in Wayne County. Well, similar to Amy, and definitely I think when Dan will speak, um, we had moderate attendance at Wayne County Parks, definitely our Heinz Park, which we focus on, um, and our other ancillary locations. Um, we had a moderate number of attendance, but again, once everything opened back up to allow you know, individuals to go into the park system, um, we saw probably similar uh, 25 to 30% increase just of daily use, seeing people bike run, walk along Heinz Park, out with their families, um, able to enjoy on a daily basis. Um, so, you know, we saw the same thing, but we had the challenges just the same um, with just um, being able to keep up with the amount of individuals that were coming out to the park. It's on a daily basis, again, um, it, it's a moderate number, but I think that probably tripled on a daily basis throughout the week because people were staying at home, they were working remotely, so they were able to move their offices out to the park. Um, and so we saw that uptick in attendance during that time as well. So, I mean, again, we, we worked with the ebb and flow, as Amy attests to, you know, we talked about, you know, similar situations and how we were going to kind of govern individuals of using those amenities that were still available. We had basketball courts closed, we had bike parks closed just because of the contact and being able to keep socially distanced. So, you know, able to do that and also able to encourage people to, under, uh, to enjoy the green space as it was there for them to um, have available to them. Um, but we had the same type of challenges, but our maintenance staff and our parks team um, did some things, some, you know, innovative things to come outdoors and do more programming to be more engaged, but also to make sure we're doing socially distanced. So we were, we were, we were prepared, but we just had to make some adjustments, I think just the same as uh, Amy spoke about as well. And Dan, what about you? Uh, very similar experiences, although, you know, it, when the pandemic really set in in, in the state of Michigan in, in March of 2020, that's not a time of the year when we're anticipating a lot of park Rush, attendance. Right. <laughs> and we were pretty quickly overwhelmed. I mean, that's a, that's a period of time before we really onboard our seasonal employees. We had relatively few folks that were working in our parks, but we were seeing levels of attendance in our day use areas that would be equivalent to what we would see typically like in May or in June. Uh, so it was a real challenge for us, uh, particularly in the early days of the pandemic, of trying to, you know, kind of find that sweet spot with our staffing levels and being able to do sort of the, the crowd management and the visitation management that, that were necessary for us. But then throughout, you know, throughout the year, uh, we continue to see that trend continue. On a typical year, we might visit or you know, have 26, 27 million people come through the front gate and visit us at one of our 103 state parks. And, and in 2020, we had 36 million people come through the front gate and visit us at one of our, uh, at one of our state parks. So we saw a tremendous increase uh, in visitation. Um, and in addition to our day use areas, we've seen that uh, that trend continue in our campgrounds as well. And so we have a lot of campgrounds at a lot of our state parks and um, we have seen, uh, you know, weekend level attendance on a weekday and holiday weekend attendance on, on your average weekend. And that's a phenomenon that, you know, didn't just stop in 2020. That trend has certainly continued into 2021 for us as well. And, one of the benchmarks that we use for attendance in our parks are the number of camp nights that we sell during, during the, a given year. And usually we'll sell our, our millionth camp night sometime in October. And we hit our millionth camp night uh, in the second week of August in 2021. So wow. folks are not just, you know, I, I think there's something that's, for those of us who work in the outdoor recreation uh, field, there's something that's kind of exciting that's happening, this phenomenon that's happening where folks are reconnecting uh, in a way with, with these, natural, uh, these natural experiences, these outdoor experiences. And we're so fortunate to be in a state that's so blessed with not just tremendous state park resources, but county parks and other uh, park and recreation authorities that are there to provide them. And Alicia, talk about the fact that uh, I believe the park system never really fully closed. Aspects of the parks were closed at certain periods. Um, if that's the case, what do you think accounts for that? I mean, I would think maybe some serious lobbying going on. <laughs> 
Well, I mean, it, right, you, you're correct, Vicki. It didn't never fully close, but we had specific amenities that closed during that because of the social distancing, just restrictions. Um, but because we did not do any picnic reservations, shelter reservations for 2020. Um, at that time, there were restrictions on how many could gather, even outdoors. So we did not uh, do any reservations, but individuals still uh, utilize those shelters to do that. Um, you know, start, again, trying to govern on our bike paths, on our, um, on, on our canoe and kayak yakking when you were able to do utilize your waterways with your family in order to get out and boat and things of that nature um, so it was it was again adjustment um, and where it did not fully you know restrict all of the activity but um, it did you know cause some areas where we did have to pay more attention to in order to manage and govern those specific areas um, but we were again ecstatic as Dan and Amy both talked about just about the importance that people understood of the green spaces and nominal to free activity that they could t partake of safely with their family, safely outdoors, um, and again, in order to stay healthy and fit, but it, we had to make those specific adjustments in order to keep up with just the momentum of everything. And Dan, were you ever concerned at any point that the park system would be completely shut down? That was never really a, a topic that got any serious discussion with us. In fact, one of the earliest conversations that I'd had with um, then uh, Director Gordon of the Department of Health and Human Services, and he reached out to me and said, "Listen, whatever you do, I hope you're not. I hope you're not thinking about closing down state parks." And it, the thought had never really entered into my mind. But right from the get-go, from the earliest days of the pandemic, I think the fact that you know public outdoor spaces were a place that people could safely go, uh, folks needed a, a, the opportunity to just kind of feel some release release and some mental relief right. from you know everything that we were all trying to process at that time um, and so uh, you know again as you know what we're talking about here it really elevated I think and underscored the importance and the value that public outdoor recreation spaces have for um, uh, for us and the benefits that we derive are not just um, you know it's not just they're not just fun places to go but they're really central to um, you know s securing and sustaining our mental health our physical health as we've talked about and and really I think represents the character of who the state is and who the state wants to be Amy same question thanks so you know one of the things that I think that, you know, we, we all had this, this feeling and you know, sometimes we've, we, people take public parks for granted. Mm -hmm. but I think one of the things that we learned during the pandemic is that you have to be really intentional in the investments that you're making in public parks so that they are there for people and so that people can continue to enjoy them. And then I, one of the things that we heard a lot from like local businesses in, in the five counties where the metro parks are located was how business was booming because the parks were booming, right? So bicycle shops were sold out. They had people on wait lists. You couldn't buy a kayak for miles and miles around. And that idea of just that, that rediscovery and reconnecting and, and the fact that, um, you know, yes, we individually feel better when we're outside, but um, some of the slides that you see up on the screen um, prior to the pandemic, we, um, the Metro Parks commissioned a study by the Trust for Public Land to really drill down into those economic benefits of public parks and specifically the Metro Parks. And at that time, and this was pre-pandemic, keeping in mind that our attendance was a lot lower than the um, the research showed that the average person who was under 65 years old who was spending time in public parks, specifically the metro parks on a regular basis, was saving like 2,500 bucks a year mm -hmm. in health insurance costs. Wow. People older than that, I'm sorry, people over 65 were at 2,500. People younger were about half that. But if you look at that, not just in your own personal budget, but in everybody's agency's budget, in your, your business budget, those kind of savings just really continue to underscore the value of public parks throughout the economy in addition to the, the public park systems um, and, and the, the local units in which they're located because it is this big virtuous cycle of, of economic benefits. All right, and uh, just for our audience, we'll be taking your questions uh, at the end of our discussion. So get those quest questions ready. And if you're social and you take some photos or you want to do a post on social media, please use the hashtag MPC21 so we can find your post easily. Uh, next question, Dan, and you mentioned it a bit, uh, staffing. 
a lot of businesses, uh, business owners in this room, and others are having a hard time finding workers. What's it been like for you? We are also in the tourism business, so it's been a very difficult year for us. Um, you know, finding you know finding folks who who want to work. Some of the examples that I've I've used with. Um, just in my hometown, if you drive down, I live in just outside of Mount Pleasant. If you drive down Mission Street, Subway will pay somebody 15, 16 bucks an hour to make sandwiches in the air conditioning, and I'll pay someone 11 bucks an hour to clean toilets in a state park. Um, it, yeah, it which was, one would you choose? Well, it's a, you know it was a real con, you know it was a real conundrum for us, and I know that was an experience that every employer across the state was was having to contend with this last year. So you know staffing certainly is kind of an ongoing challenge for us in the state park system, um, and then you know with the increased attendance and the increased uses at our state parks, it's underscored the fact that um, we celebrated the 100th birthday of the Michigan State Park System here about two years ago. Um, and there are a lot of facilities that were, you know, brand spanking new in the 1950s and the 1960s, and we're still kind of coasting on the fumes of those investments that we made at that time. So there's a lot of work for us to do, I think, in, um, you know, trying to build up a contemporary system with that is, um, you know, relatively easy for us to manage, that the facilities are in good condition, where it's relatively easy for us to recruit and retain employees. Those are all challenges that we, you know, we have to contend with every single year when you run a system as big as, as we do, 103 state parks and recreation areas across all, you know, all corners of the state. It's not uncomplicated. Amy, same question. We have um, we had some challenges in hiring this summer, Our, but we've had traditionally some challenges in specific areas of hiring. Um, we operate several pools and aquatic facilities. And so one of the big things that we've been working on with our partners is um, getting more people interested in swimming and more kids. We want kids to be safe when they swim in lakes and in pools, but we also want to grow our own lifeguard um, pool of bad sorry about that um, so that was one of our that's always one of our biggest challenges getting enough enough people to work in our pools to keep them open so that we can have and uh, we started swim lessons this summer some of them were um, at Lake St. Clair Metro Park some of them were in um, um, partnership with the city of Detroit Parks and Recreation Department we're working together on a regional swim survey um, that's going to look at gaps in programming um, and um, so we can fill those gaps throughout the five county region. Um, so if anybody out there is a swimmer or you have kids who um, are looking for a summer job, we would be happy to have them anytime <laughs> at the, the metro parks. Um, but lifeguards have been our biggest challenge. We've got a really good seasonal workforce that tends to return year after year. And I, I totally get the, you know, First of all, everybody has an economic reality, mm -hmm. right? So sometimes if you'd rather be outdoors, you've got to be inside making sandwiches at, at Subway. But um, you know, I, my first job in parks and recreation was um, actually picking up trash and putting it back into the landfill in my hometown. So I have cleaned those toilets and painted those garbage cans. And even though it's not the most glamorous of summer jobs, it's one of those ways that you, you learn how systems work. You learn who is the most important person in any system. And I'm going to tell you right now, it's the person who cleans the bathroom and picks up the garbage. Um, and so there is a lot of value and meaning in that. Yeah, I think they're underappreciated too, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. <laughs> and Alicia, any challenges in uh, Wayne County uh, Park System when it came to staffing? Same echoing, um, the same as my colleagues. I mean, just a challenge we had one specific area, um, typically in our maintenance, that we've had you know struggles with recruiting and retaining, um, just of compensation. And when you're dealing with, as you said, signing bonuses of five hundred dollars, you know, at Burger King to sign on, you know, we can't recruit if we're paying you know ten fifty seven an hour for a part maintenance employee or a laborer to come out and help clean our restrooms or pick up trash or weed whip and things of that nature. So that's always been the challenge for us. Um, but our maintenance team that we do have have always risen to the occasion. I'm sure like many of our colleagues can talk about, you know, because they have that passion, because they are committed to making sure they present the best green space for those users that come to the parks. But we definitely would have to look at, you know, what we can do to bring some, you know, equality or, you know, kind of balance it the best we possibly can and know we're a government. I mean, know that our funding is restricted because right. it's based on property value 
I use millage monies um, as well, um, and you know how our general fund balances out in the collection of those. But to really figure out how we can do that um, to you know kind of alleviate as many challenges. Thankfully, but unfortunately, we did not have our water park open this year um, because we would have had the challenge of lifeguards. Amy and I talked uh, early on if we were going to do that, and just the recruitment of those as well. The same challenge with just the disparity in, in, in rates and trying to recruit. And as you said, many businesses are having the same impact um, that we are. So, and we're still having that same challenge. So our you know, steady 25 maintenance and our uh, managers and foremen are making sure they're keeping you know, nearly 4,700 acres with 5,600, but 4,700 that we're definitely maintaining. They're keeping those pristine in our comfort stations and everything else that we're offering, uh, sanitizing playscapes and inspecting those. So, you know, we, we, we'll, 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 we'll roll with it and we'll figure out what we need to do, but we definitely, you know, would not be able to do it without that staff. They're the, they're the important people, as Amy said. Have you all done anything creatively to address that issue that you could share? And will it come down to increasing user fees if, or uh, fees for services? Well, one of the things that we've worked on, and this is this is something we've worked on, because the you know the challenges that we've had with recruitment, and particularly for our seasonal employees, is is isn't new. It was just exacerbated this year, uh, in particular with how competitive the job marketplace was. But we've we've worked with, um, frankly, the folks in the legislature have been you know helpful and supportive in trying to allow us to have. Uh, you know, different rates of pay based on geography or that kind of thing to try and help uh, help us be a little bit more competitive in the job market. There are some, you know, there are some job markets where uh, we can't pay competitively. There are some where, you know, we're kind of right in line and right in market. Um, but it's taken that kind of work and that kind of massaging to be able to, you know, acknowledge and account for some of those regional differences. And when, when you have challenges in recruiting employees like we've talked about against a backdrop with the level of attendance that we've seen, you know, it really, you know, it really just kind of highlights that difference and it puts that strain. Um, and, you know, as, as Amy and, and Alicia have talked about, you know, how much we have depended on the folks that did show up and our folks who are, provide the backbone of, of our system because we asked them to do an awful lot uh, under some very challenging circumstances right. with fewer staff, fewer mm -hmm. hands on board. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We were, this year, one of the things that we did was um, for our seasonal employees, we've always had an hourly bonus at the end of the summer. And our board approved a pretty generous increase to that hourly bonus because we didn't want to just sign people and have them leave, right? So I, um, we're talking about signs. There's a, a store not far from where I live that says $500 for 500 hours. And we didn't want people to just like come and go, right? Come in, in and out. So. We think the hourly bonus that we paid at the end of the summer was, was helpful and it gives us the flexibility of, of kind of going back and forth with that. And we're having a big conversation at our, our board and leadership level right now about um, what is, what should our minimum level of pay be in the metro parks? Um, it's part of that, nat that national discussion about a $15, min um, $15 minimum wage and we're where do we fall on that and how can we support that and, and where does that work? Um, all of our full-time employees make more than that per hour. Um, our part-time people, some of our part-time people don't and then some of our seasonal folks fall below that as well. So it's a really big conversation to have and I expect it will be an ongoing conversation for a while until we find exactly the right balance. Right, and our, and our county executive, Mr. Evans, you know, has um, definitely um, that you know he's been cognizant of that, and so definitely they've focused on now with the, working with our central HR of doing a study, but also again looking at those particular salaries that are below the margin at, from the minimum wage, and so looking at bringing that up to parity. So hopefully, in those areas that we've had challenges, which I mentioned, the laborers, we'll be able to recruit, we'll be able to retain some of those. It's still some it, some areas that we still need to address across the board of doing some particular salary increases, but I know that when you have a county exec that gets it and is given like really the the go forth to say look at this look how we can implement and do some increases because we need to again show our employees our teams that we value them um, and also keep those good employees that we have um, and then what we do um, we just try to motivate I know me and my assistant director we try to motivate treat, treat our team as much as I know my colleagues do with respect 
you know, incentivize what we can sometimes out of our own pocket to show that we appreciate them. Um, but again, um, if, if it's, it needs to be done on a holistic view of trying to make sure that we are paying individuals what closest to what they deserve in order to keep that talent and to keep those individuals working on behalf of the county. And when it comes to the parks and to the trails and camp campgrounds and what have you, how well did they hold up with the surge in uh, usage? And uh, we'll start with you on that one, Amy. We are really lucky. We are uh, one of the things that the Metro Parks has been able to do over the course of a period of time has been to make some really good in, um, investments in infrastructure. So each year we're able to put aside a certain amount of money in capital improvements. We do focus on those areas that most people use. So in the last couple of years, um, two years ago, we, ra we did raise our annual permit um, fee to $40, and that, that $5 extra year has generated enough money that we're spending over a million, a million five every year on trails um, to keep those facilities in really great condition. Um, this year, we continue to focus on, um, on trails and also on accessibility so that more and more people can, can use the parks and experience them in the same way that, that everybody else does, whether you, um, you know, have a special need or not. Um, so some of that has been really just tremendously great planning on um, the part of the people that came before me. Um, and then also, you know, on um, you know, on, on, on the part of our board and, and making those investments every single year because it's not easy to do, right? You want to, to build up a certain amount of, of cushion and, and a savings account so if disaster strikes, you've got some money there to, to deal with it and it's always this kind of, of push and pull. Um, so we, we feel like we're doing a, a pretty good job but sooner or later our infrastructure needs are going to catch up with us in the same way the state parks have with there as we just keep chipping away at it, you know, one trail mile at a time, one playground at a time, one pavilion mm -hmm. at a time. Mm -hmm. Alicia? Yep. The, the same thing. I mean, we've had infrastructure um, that, you know, needs, you know, major investment at this point in time. Thankfully, you know, we have, you know, fund balance available that we're planning with our design team, of course, with some of the initiatives that the county exec wants us to put forth. Um, but we've spent annually $1.4 million on capital projects just for Wayne County parks. The other portion of the funding goes to our respective uh, commissioners to um, allocate funding to those particular cities that they are commissioners over. So we a total of about $3 million goes into park infrastructure, but just $1.4 million to Wayne County Parks. So we're looking at upgrading comfort stations, playgrounds, trails. We do a lot of our trail maintenance with partnerships and volunteers who help us maintain those. Um, putting in key connectors, funding going towards that, tapping into grants, grants. that we you know, have been privileged to receive, um, transportation alternative, um, TAP grants that we've received from MDOT in order to put connections to connect the community safely down to Hines Park. Um, and then we have a plan as well through our strategic master plan and our five-year recreation plan that we use to kind of guide us on what infrastructure improvements we need to um, put in place. But um, it's, it's a lot of things that you know, was new 30, 40 years ago that we need to bring up to date and then have the team to be able to maintain those moving forward. But I think in the last several years, um, we've done a, a great job and a lot of um, improvements that we've done in Hines Park. Thank you through the county exec and our department director, Beverly Watson, then definitely our parks team um, who just gets behind the initiatives and gets it done. And then the uh, state DNR, how did the uh, parks hold up? It you know, it was very well, I mean, but I have to say, I mean, you know, historically, the, you know, the funds that, that folks pay for when they, when they stay with us at one of our campgrounds or with your recreation passport, that, that money really goes towards our operations of the parks. And we have underinvested and underfunded our capital needs and our infrastructure investment for, for decades. It's really not a new phenomenon, um, but this level of intense use is really starting to underscore how important it is for us to invest back into that system. When and uh, when actually I was interviewing for this job, uh, the governor uh, asked me one of the things in the transition report was this $264 million capital backlog that we have in the state park system. And the first question she asked me was, well, what are you going to do about that? Um, well, this is not what I would have 
come up with. This wasn't the <laughs> rabbit I was going to pull out of my hat. But, but even you know, from the earliest days of the administration was a recognition of the fact that, that parks really drive uh, local communities. They drive small business. They incubate economic activity. And when our, you know, our parks need to be places that are ready to welcome visitors, that are ready to you know, receive the kind of visitation that we want, um, it's going to take some dollars, and it's going to take us kind of filling up a gap of some historic underinvestment that we've had there. You know, as I mentioned, kind of I think at the beginning that we had 36 million or so people come through the front gate, and there are 365 days in a year, and I'm not very good at math, um, but that's about 100,000 people evenly distributed every single day at one of our state parks. Now, we know not everybody, you know, evenly distributes on a day, but even with that, you know, that's 100,000 people. That makes us, I think, the seventh largest city in the state of Michigan at any given time on any given day. Mm -hmm. And with that, we've got water and sewer infrastructure, electrical, waste, you know, waste and sanitary services. We've got oh, uh, trash removal, public safety, thousands of miles of roads. I mean, we've got all the kinds of infrastructure uh, that, a, that a fairly large sized city has to deal with. Ours is just distributed all over the state of Michigan. And it's time for us to invest back into it. And that's that's really why the governor, I think, focused on investing $250 million of the ARP money back into our state park system and then also made the announcement of $150 million for our local recreation partners so that they can make those same kinds of investments back into theirs. Mm -hmm. and, and those grants are really critical. In the last three years, we've, gener we've um, been able to just secure about $5 million in grants for capital improvements in the metro parks from some of those grant sources that come through the DNR, through the Michigan Natural Resources Trust Fund, and through the Land and Water Conservation Fund, and others, the Recreation Passport um, Fund. And we're super excited about the, the $150 million that is part of that ARP money that's going to be designated in grant programs for local parks. It's a competitive program, so it's it's you know, you've got to have a good project to get funded, right? And it's an objective program so that those grant applications are scored in, in a way that um, assures that everybody is on an equal playing field. And I think that's one of the really um, sort of the unsung um, activities that the DNR provides to local unit, that kind of partnership. And, and these are conversations that go on. Alicia mentioned their five-year plan. We all have to have a five-year plan to be eligible for those funds. And that is, you know, it's, it's really focused on, on making those things happen, those priorities. There's a requirement to reach out to every community within your five-year plan and see what local, local priorities are. So it's not, you know, me or Alicia right. or Dan sitting in our office going, wouldn't it be super cool if we did that? Right. It, um, we think we're good listeners anyway, but it requires us to listen as well. Yeah, we did that, too, in the city of Detroit yeah. with the ARPA meetings to come up with how that money should be spent. And a nice chunk of it will be going to parks and recreation. So um, I think the pandemic has shown us that, you know, these are wise investments, right? Yeah, and you're in the process of updating your five-year plan, too. And the, that community outreach, you guys do such a great yeah job with that and you can see that every time a new neighborhood park reopens um, and what that means to people all right in terms of um, innovation what what can we anticipate let's see let's well, go uh, well you know what's really really I thought was kind of humorous um, that we asked people to come out to the parks to enjoy themselves and I mentioned earlier that people were working you know, sometimes remotely in the parks. So we, you know, <laughs> have been asked to have Wi-Fi in our parks. You know, oh, come wow. to the park. We don't want you. Want you to detach. I never even computer. thought about that. Want one. you to detach. But you know, we may have to move along and you know, put some Wi-Fi in parks. So people, you know, as long as they're coming out to the park, you know, and they want to, you know, do some level of release, we might have to, you know, upgrade that technology to have Wi-Fi available in certain aspects of the park. You know, we've been tapped on to um, look at putting. Um, electric vehicle charging stations, oh, yeah. you know, not directly, you know, a revenue generation, but just to have that accessible to the users that come to our parks. And then just really open up and engaging our waterways and promoting those even more. We're responsible for the maintenance of the Rouge River. Um, our team has been removing log jams to make it more navigable. Um, 87 miles of the Rouge River, just to have access through that, that venue. So, you know, putting in more kayak and canoeing launches, um, and engaging in additional partnerships uh, here on Clinton and DNR on 
what we can do on collaborative programming and activity. So, you know, there's a lot of different um, things that may not be innovative as, as we see, but really definitely will enhance just the uh, quality of life and just the experience in our parks. Dan? Yeah, I mean, we're, uh, you know, all the things I think that Alicia kind of keyed on, we're trying to do those same kinds of things as well. We're also trying to, you know, change our business model a little bit too. Uh, so we've got, we've got projects that are underway where we're trying to convert more of our state park facilities over to renewable energy that's produced on site, lowers costs, and, st and helps to demonstrate that renewable technology is scalable and kind of locatable wherever you happen to be in the state of Michigan. And then we're always trying to stay in front of the change curve on outdoor recreation. I mean, folks, um, the preferences for activities that that's a really kind of dynamic uh, space and dynamic environment. I, you guys have probably heard me tell this story a bunch of times, but you know, five years ago, uh, nobody ever heard of fat tire biking before. Before, and you know, <laughs> cross country skiing was like, you know, way up at the top of preferred you know winter activities. Well, fat tire biking now is well overtaken cross country skiing in popularity as a winter sport. Well, there's a little bit different trail system that you have to provide in order to attract that, those users who want to come to a place like Michigan and, and ride their bike. So we're always trying to kind of stay uh, in front of that change curve and sort of look over the horizon as to what, you know, where are the trends in outdoor recreation going and then how do we plan facilities and amenities that will meet them so that folks choose Michigan when, when they're making a, making a plan for a trip based on outdoor recreation. Well, that one went right by me, Dan. I, I, I heard of the fat tire biking. <laughs> I hadn't either until, you know, five years ago, so. And uh, Amy? One of the things we've been concentrating on at the Metro Parks in the last couple of years, and you can see from the Trust for Public Land study, is um, gathering data and using data really well. So we can see where there are gaps in our service because everybody should benefit equally from parks and, and from the metro parks. So um, being able to use that zip code data that we collect has been really important to us in making good business decisions, making good ser um, service decisions, and, and really drilling down into some of our, um, our issues in serving diverse and equitable groups of, of folks where we've had big gaps historically over the, um, the entire history of the metro parks. Um, and also, it's, it's collecting that data and, and telling the story, right? So that people will come and they will listen and they will understand that p great public spaces don't just happen, mm -hmm. right? They have to be provided for in budgets. They have to be supported by tax dollars. And these investments have to be made year after year after year. And some of the, the data that we've collected has been, um, at the end of the summer, for example, um, we had this great partnership with DTE. They called us up and said, hey, um, we'd like to do something for the community. Um, could we do some free weekends? And we said, yeah, you can. And, but part of the reason that we could do that is we could, the day that program was over, we could provide them with the zip code of every single person who came in to the metro parks, who got one of those daily permits so that they could see that they were serving their service area and they were meeting their business goals and being you know, partners with the public sector. So making that decision, being able to talk about how parks manage stormwater as part of, of, of you know, climate change is such a huge issue because who thinks about that, right? You think about playing t-ball, right. or you think about camping, or, or running on a trail, or walking in the woods. But all of those things that, that parks do, as you know, in and of themselves, whether we look at them as, as small or big cities, are really vital information to get into people's hands so that they can support public spaces, they can make great decisions on funding, on supporting funding initiatives, um, like with the recent changes to the Michigan Natural Resources Trust Fund in the Constitution, um, the people of the state of Michigan made that happen. Some more grant dollars are available. All right, before we uh, turn it to audience questions, I'm going to do my last question, but we do have Jim and someone else uh, helping out with questions. So if you have one, uh, when the time comes, raise your hand. Uh, but my last question is, uh, how about the park users? Some of the people that are looking at you right now, have they been on their best behavior? <laughs> or or um, have we seen some not so nice park users? 
I'll start if you want. Um, so the metro, we do. And what's your message to, yeah. to park goers? So I will say to you that like 99.9% .9 of people who come to a public park, whether it's a metro park, a Wayne County park, a state park are coming because they want to have fun. They want to, to get away and they behave themselves like model citizens, right? They're great people. Um, every once in a while, it's no different than, you know, at the dinner table. You have an argument with your family, um, but park users have been on really great behavior, you know, getting the word out about picking up after yourselves when you're in the parks. Um, people have responded to that, to that really well. Um, I mentioned the disc golf courses when we said, you know, we, you can't, you cannot play on our courses if you won't socially distance. They're like, all right. Because it's, it's important to me. So um, I just, seriously, the public has been great. I have, I have zero complaints. Alicia. And, 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 and I echo Amy. You know, the majority of our park users um, have, you know, appreciated the parks. They do their part in making sure that they can keep them clean, respecting, you know, those spaces. But we do have a few bad apples, and particularly when we're putting in these investments, you know, to make your experience better, you know. You know, please don't, you know, etch your name into our, you know, engineered wood fiber for our, you know, connect. Don't tag the or, property, or, right? Or, or, burn, or burn, you know, burn the, your grill under our picnic pavilion. Oh. You know, so we do have a few of those who may um, uh, step outside of appreciating the space, but very rarely. Overall, we have individuals that, again, just go to have fun, enjoy the space, um, do what they can in their park to keep it clean and presentable for the next user. Dan. You know, I think at the Department of Natural Resources, we we view ourselves as trustees. You know, we we are, you know, the ones who have the privilege of being uh, the tr sort of the managers of these places and that that are held in trust for the benefit of the people of the state of Michigan. And uh, we take that that responsibility very seriously, and our, our visitors do too. I mean, I think everybody sort of viscerally understands when you walk into a park, you walk into uh, a natural area or part of the state forest system around. A trail, you instinctively understand that 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 this is this is something that all of us own, and and we all own uh, an, an equal share of it, just by virtue of our citizenship in this state. And, and Michiganders, time and time again, as Amy was alluding to, generation after generation have reaffirmed that these are places that are important to them. And we know that so long as uh, as long as the people of Michigan come out and see us at our in our parks and in our public spaces, they're going to be well taken care of. All right, and with that, we'll go to audience questions. Anyone? All right, we've got uh, Shahida. Oh, we'll go to we'll go to the gentleman over here first, and then Shahida. Yeah. Oh, okay, you can hold it. Uh, okay, you uh, I know you have a common problem with everybody on shortage of the labor and the disparity with the pay, that it's almost national. But I'd like to hear from you how the law enforcement working with you and responding to the park when it's needed or how it's been patrolled to show the public their law enforcement for the certain group of people to behave well, how you and the law enforcement working together? That's a good question. So the, the Metro Parks have a police department within the Metro Parks, and we have for decades. Um, and, you know, most of our police officers do what, uh, are they're, they're community policing officers, right? So they have a strong community policing model where they are available and accessible to people. Um, and I think that goes a really long way, because if you come into a park and you feel respected rather than suspected, your entire experience is going to be different with that. Um, one of the things that we've been concentrating on with our police department over the course of the last few years is um, really focusing in on training um, on issues of diversity and equity in the metro parks so that we can provide better service to the people who come into the metro parks. We have great relationships with local law enforcement as well. Um, Sometimes we have to call um, local law enforcement for backup on um, if we're really busy, they'll help us with traffic. Or if we have an accident in a park that they respond to. Um, so it's a really, we're in a really privileged position within the Metro Parks that our police officers 
are Metro Parks police officers. They don't have to divide their attention into many other things. Um, and that has worked really tr tremendously well for us. And Commissioner, thank you for your question. Um, because as you know, Wayne County Parks, our Wayne County sheriffs um, work within our park system. And so we have an office um, along Hines Park that we have at least um, uh, three to five um, sheriffs that patrol all of our Hines Park areas. So we, again, they have an outreach of support to those other municipal areas that we may have parks within Refford Township or the city of Inkster or within Trenton as well. Um, but our um, Wayne County sheriffs um, in the park system uh, do more of education. Um, there is some level of enforcement as we're Hines is a, along a linear park. So people may exceed the speed limit at times um, during, uh, going down Hines. So of course they issue those respective tickets. But they do particular education and the use of amenities, um, gatherings, things of that nature. And then citations, um, I think, as the last resort. Um, but they respond well whenever there's a need. Um, and also, again, just general patrol of our spaces for events and activities as well. So we have a good relationship with them. Um, but again, they may have to respond if there are particular shortages somewhere else off of Heinz Park. And so there are times that there may not be a level of enforcement at a particular period, um, but that is like the, not the norm on a, on a daily basis. Dan. Well, for law enforcement in our, our parks, we have our commissioned uh, parks and recreation rangers and non-commissioned parks and recreation rangers who are, you know, primarily what their job is, is to make sure that, you know, everyone's there is safe, they're having a good time, uh, and that kind of thing. And they have the ability to uh, to undertake enforcement of regulations if need be. And then, um, you know, our conservation officers, we have 262 uh, sworn conservation officers in um, in our law enforcement department. They provide uh, support uh, to our, our parks as well. And then we have great relationships with, with our, you know, county sheriffs and other local law enforcement as well as MSP that help us out from time to time uh, in the parks. But, the you know, the big thing uh, is that uh, you know we're in the hospitality business our job is to make sure that you know folks are there they're having a good time as Alicia was saying that you know if you've got questions about the amenities that we want to try and provide a good positive visitor experience for everybody who comes through that front gate and that that you know that perspective and that value um, our our folks in our uh, parks and recreation division you know all the way through our law enforcement division I think they really try and express that value that you know our job here is really to provide you know hospitality and safety and that kind of thing and and that's how they really view their mission and I think that really shows in uh, in how they conduct themselves and I know there were some issues initially when um, the DNR took over the Belle Isle but it seems like those have pretty much smoothed out uh, what accounts for that I don't know if Chief Craig would agree with me on that one, but um. <laughs> well, you know, Belle Isle, you know, that's a that's a as as you well know, it is a it's a magical that is just a magical place. place it really and, is. Um, it's a you jewel. Know, it was, uh, you know, that we. Um, took over the management responsibility for Belle Isle before I, I got into this role. But, but again, I mean, that's just a really, I think, good example of, you know, trying to get um, the cadence right with law enforcement with, through a lot of honest conversations with, you know, our community leaders, with our visitors, um, responding to what, you know, you know, families and residents are telling us for what they want to see from our staff and from our law enforcement folks that are out there. And, and I think by and large, we've kind of gotten it right, just like we do with every one of our parks, you know, all the way from the west end of the UP down to, you know, um, down in Monroe, Sterling State Park. You know, there are issues that come up from time to time everywhere. And that's just because wherever humans gather, things from time to time happens. But, you know, by and large, our, our parks are just you know, fantastic places to be, and they're wonderful places for, for families and anyone else who wants to get outdoors. All right, great. Next question. Hi, I'm Shahida Mousy from the Aretha Franklin Amphitheater, which is a city of Detroit facility. Um, my question is, now that we have all uh, endured such short staffing, <laughs> do you envision that those staffing levels will ever actually go back to what they once were. We, we have come through it, not necessarily with flying colors, but we've come through it for the most part. Um, and we've seen dramatic increases in usage, right, that we probably all hope will continue. 
So what, how should we look at the future in terms of staffing levels? I mean, we know we have to pay people, but uh, what's, uh, where's the, where's it going? the balance going to strike, in your opinion? Honestly, I don't, I don't think it'll ever, I, don't, I, I won't say ever, but it, it's going to take a minute to really bounce back, I think, um, to recoup. Um, even with the increases in salaries, um, looking at compensation, um, there's always someone that's going to pay better. It's always going to be someone that has additional benefit than we have. Um, I think it will regain, um, but I think it probably will take a few years in order to bounce back. And, you know, those agencies, and I know you as a business owner, uh, trying to recruit and think of some innovative ways or thinking incentivizing to try to attract and retain those individuals. But I think, again, we, sh we saw the challenges across the board, not only in uh, government um, with, you know, small businesses, businesses, with corporations to some regard as well. Um, and so I think it's going to take a minute to rebound, rebound the same as economically, um, hopefully within the next couple of years. But I think, you know, we'll be making strides in the, in the right direction in order to get back to the level, hopefully exceed the level moving forward. But we're, we're just going to have to, again, what we're doing now, think on our feet, adjust and plan, you know, the best that we, you know, possibly can in order to make sure that we're still providing a level of service or maybe readjusting the services that we're providing in order to maximize in one particular area or so. Let's take our final question. Uh, Vicki, Dan Wyant, Edward Lowe Foundation. I, I really appreciate this conversation on the intersection of economic opportunity and inclusion, expansion of conservation and health. And so you can really look at the opportunity for Michigan. And I'm, I'm, I'm curious, my question is, given the challenges funding infrastructure, talent. What's the one thing you'd like to see the state do more of, each one of them? It's a great question. Dan, you want to give that one a shot? I assume yes. that was for <laughs> me. <laughs> right. You right. phrased so. the question that way. <laughs> uh, you know, I think that uh, one thing that we need to do, and I think we're, we're recognizing and we're trying to put some work towards it, is that, you know, at least for, I can speak for our agency and for our parks and recreation, uh, division, we have not been as present in as many communities as we need to as we need to have been. Um, you know, there is um, there are lots of wonderful places that we manage that are scattered scattered hither and yon across the state of Michigan. We don't have a lot of park uh, or recreation amenities that we manage um, that are in close proximity to where most of the people in the state of Michigan live, and that's a problem. Um, Belle Isle Park is a, you know, that's a, that's a good example of, you know, I think how important um, an urban state park can be, not only for our agency, but, uh, you know, for, for the community writ large. We need to be doing more of that. So I would like to see us be uh, a lot more intentional about being present and active in urban communities with, with outdoor, you know, providing outdoor recreation services. Flint State Park, um, Governor announced in July her intention to establish the first state park in the city of Flint. First state park, uh, first state dirt that the department will manage anywhere in Genesee County. I think it was the one county out of 83 where the Department of Natural Resources uh, doesn't own any property. Um, and I, I think that's really significant. And I, I, you know, to me, I think leaning into urban communities and development, working very closely, it doesn't always have to be us that manages it, but helping to lift up our partners that do work in uh, urban parks and urban communities, that's something that we as an agency absolutely have to do more of. Amy, Alicia, Dan, thank you all for uh, a great session. This is you. actually the first session to open the conference and awesome job. Your passion came through. We can tell that you're dedicated to the work. So let's give them one more round of applause. And Amy, I'll turn it over for you uh, to you for any final thoughts. Oh, um, I would just, again, like to thank everyone for being here. I hope that when, when you leave the, the room today that um, some of the things that we've talked about really stick with you and that you can be actively involved and engaged in, in continuing to support and grow public recreation opportunities throughout the entire state. There are all kinds of organizations, local, state, national, regional, that are doing phenomenal work and really um, deserve your attention. So thank you for the attention you've paid to us today. We hope that we'll have the opportunity to continue to work with you well into the future. Thank you. Good job. All righty. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you.